Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back. I'm Kirby Kid or Richard Terrell and this is Design Over Time over there, which is a daily design video series in which I talk about just about any design topic that comes around in my everyday life. So over the weekend, I watched this movie, as you can see over here, called uh, Journey to the West. And whenever I watch movies, I, you know, I love movies, but I get really inspired to understand, you know, what the movie is communicating, how it's working, how it's getting across its ideas and its emotions via its uh, direction, its scene composition, visual, uh, you know, sort of visual design, audio design, all of that, and obviously story design. You know, today in this episode, I just wanted to go over a few scenes from this movie. Uh, try not to spoil too much, try not to show too much, but just give you an idea of some of the things that I was inspired by when I was watching it. Without getting too much into those details, if we just stop and consider, hey, uh, what's happening in this film? Uh, how is it getting its message across? And if we kind of treat this film as if it were a video game, I think we're going to find a lot of interesting topics, a lot of interesting things to highlight, uh, even as a thought experiment, and that's exactly what I want to do in this video. So, without further delay, I want to show you a few clips of Journey to the West, and I want to talk about them as if they were a video game, or if we were to turn this exact kind of scene into a video game, what would be the pros and cons, and what would be my uh, best approach, so. Okay, so here's the intro to the film. And as you can see from the set, uh, the film is sort of set on this sort of water river village in between two mountain passes or whatever. Um, and the whole intro to this, this film is entirely set right here. We introduce our main characters and sort of, of the main conflict. Just looking at the structure right here, uh, there's a lot going on here and I think the film does a really good job of set, making a lot of interesting actions that happen on this waterfront. Uh, very sort of taking advantage of all the level design structure that you see here. Just right off the bat, this camera perspective reminds me a lot of what you see in Captain Toad. So, you know, in a, in a very basic sense, this entire set from this viewing perspective could be a 2D game. It could be pulled off in 2D. Like, I'll show you what I mean here. You know, this is the same set, a little bit zoomed in, but as you can see, um, you know, you could kind of treat this line right there and maybe right here as just like your 2d perspective so you just walk left and right and there's not a lot of forward and back motion you could treat this as the second level for 2d and right here a third level so just a uh, a relatively basic three-tier platform uh, for a platformer but you know 2d gameplay really simplifies things and especially when you're reviewing it from this zoom out view you get a lot of that um you get a really clear perspective on what's happening in the game. However, you know, this set, typically when people are um, trying to recreate or get inspired by things that they see in movies or whatever, they don't make their systems 2D when the movie is clearly 3D, right? So this set is built in real life and it's 3D, so that technically means all the space here and all the space vertically going up here. I'll draw like a semi three dimensional box just to give you a little bit of a perspective thing going on. But all that space matters, right? And you can jump off the bridge. And if this were 2D, you know, jumping off the bridge into the water here uh, wouldn't quite be a thing. Um, and then you'd only be able to swim to the water here and here. And uh, you wouldn't be necessarily be able to fall like from here, down here, and then go up here and then swim over here. Like a lot of times, 2D just simplifies the gameplay and. Um, you know, everybody kind of likes it when gameplay is clear and interesting and simple. But uh, for the purposes of 3D, we're going to go ahead and keep the space dynamic and just think about what, how to present this kind of space uh, in an effective way for a video game. And I, I know a lot of video games t are typically designed around large, flat, open areas like fields and, and mountains. Or um, so a lot of them are designed around urban areas like skyscrapers and buildings and insides of rooms. But this set right off the bat is kind of... I mean, it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? You get a nice wide open area, right? Which has a lot of verticality and a lot of like opportunity to move from high areas to low areas, but you also get, like this area is really open. Um, you also can see into all these areas. You can see in here, 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 here. You don't actually have to go in these buildings to see the interesting things you're doing. Hanging fish, uh, this is <laughs> the main character right there, hanging from his hands. Uh, you get this huge water wheel right here, right? Um, and you can obviously see these ladders and stairs. So this point of view 
takes advantage of sort of the open space and because everything's sort of presented in a U shape and from one perspective, this really reminds me of Captain Toad. Captain Toad really did well with this diorama style 3D worlds, right? So instead of worrying about too much uh, occlusion, too many things getting in front of the camera, too much about um, camera perspective and far as like the character and players constantly manipulating the camera, what they did in a lot of Captain Toad levels is just present you with a uh, what I call a diorama um, style 3D world and you can start from one end and move entirely through it right and like just start here and move here go down here up here without changing the camera right and you can see me trace this line all the way up here go up here come up here drop down drop down platform go behind there walk across this bridge walk across this bridge over here, down, up. That's not a that's not a walkway, but you can get up here. You know, get up here, walk along the back. So mostly these bridges in the middle are the primary ways to get from one side to the other. This area back here doesn't look like it's too traversable, but from a single uh, camera perspective, you get quite a lot of visual. Um, you can see quite a lot from this perspective, and that's why I think Captain Toad does so well. It's also why I think this set works so well from a filming point of view. So we'll see, we'll see a little bit more uh, going on here. So he tells everyone it's safe and then they hang this guy for you know speaking the truth. That's what happens to main characters. But then they realize that um, there's a demon that's still in the water. Yeah, like that. So it's cool. It's just like a uh, Broadway, a Broadway set. You can see so much happening from your your seat that it's just incredible. Okay, so there's this there's the scene that we were looking at. Uh, we just realized uh, in the film that you know the, the the lake demon has the ability to grab people and they try to move higher and higher in order to escape it. But then we soon find out that it has the ability to sort of reach even on the second level here. So. Uh, this this entire set piece has tears to it, easy to understand, uh, you know, in the water versus, I'll show you. Yeah, so in the water, not good. Then you have tier one, tier two, which goes over there, and tier three. And we know that the demon let me see, can attack from out of the water and get here. And we soon learn that he can kind of attack a little bit and get up here, but the third level is safe, right? So just doing a really good job creating an interesting space for the, the players, the characters to move around in, and making that those spaces distinct and interesting, right? And something that the viewer can count and just kind of understand what the risk and rewards are for, for the various positions. I mean, this is set up so much like a, a game because, you know, just like in real life, the actions of the characters in a film need to be understandable. Like you want to know what they're thinking, you want to know uh, how they're evaluating the situation, which includes risk reward. You want to clearly see something and and get most of the information, so that um, as the scene plays out, you're you're right there along for the dramatic action. All right, so now no more grabby thing, right? And then you find out that the thing can jump. So that's a really good scene. All right. All right, took a screenshot of that real quick. So yeah, as you can see here, level design, orange. This is level one. This is level two, and then the people that got to the very top because they were most afraid were up here, as you can see, tiny ladder up here, and they were inside this area. And then the little girl who was up there tried to run like this, got tagged by the, the enemy element, this long tentacle, got pulled, broke, broke the, the level element here, and then uh, 
And then after they cut the tentacle off, right? They figured, they found out that the beast can jump out of the water and, and bite people even on level three, right? So the escalation of the scene is pretty interesting. How the beast first started in the water, then it's, and then it attacked people on level one, then it attacked people on level two, and then it, it attacked on level three. Um, but then, you know, they countered that with some interplay, you know, classic boss style interplay. And then um, the creature leaps out of the water and gets you on the third level. So as far as the construction of uh, the, the push and pull of this battle, right, this, this movie is doing a really good job of escalating, right? Using the environment, uh, using people's natural reactions, push and pull, run away from boss. What does the boss do? Finds a way and like run away, it, it tags you anyway, cut off the tentacle, then it has its final ability, which is to jump out of the water. So the, the stage has been set and the, and the battle dynamics have escalated to this point. So what happens in the rest of the scene is still really interesting, but um, I wanna show you this one transformation left. So then the fish hits the, um, the bridge from the third level. And then as you can see, it breaks it and now they show a really clean scene here with it, like there. So now the third level goes to the second level and the, the, the broken bridge, the broken walkway creates these like dynamic moving platforms, right? So the this, this second level is a teeter-totter, as you can see here. Connecting the, the third level to the second and the second to the first, right? And now we have this really interesting balancing act that we're going to play. And the fish can play too, right? So like everything about this thing, every little piece, everything about the way the space is constructed and, and the, the pros and cons of being high versus low are played around with a lot in this, in this scene. <laughs> and cool stuff happens. So I just thought this scene was uh, excellently constructed, right? It was constructed in a way that the, vis the, the actual environment creates different opportunities for all the characters, not just the main characters and the, and the most active characters, but all the characters. And then uh, it gives the boss, the fish, the demon fish in this case, um, a chance to showcase its abilities. Uh, everything escalates. There's actual like level transformation, like in a really cool platformer. So I would say overall this game, recreating this kind of a set piece, you would have to think along the lines of Captain Toad or a platformer, because essentially all the characters do is kind of run around. And uh, even when a lot of the interactions between the the demon and the, the the townspeople those could mostly be uh, very simple interactions automatic things quick time events whatever yeah the most interesting parts about this fight are not necessarily um you know the the, the weapon based combat right cutting the tentacle it's actually movement based like where are all the people going to go how they swim where do they go once they reach the the uh, the pier and like the different elevations and then how everything comes crashing down uh and you know everything comes to a head later on in this scene i'll just show you one one bit right here and because everything is sort of tied in this dynamic space you know the, the people on the side can help the action that's happening in the middle because they can cut ropes. And as you can see there, that platforming feat, uh, getting up to the third floor from the base using the wheel, just just a lot of interesting things that would make, just making the space more interesting, right? The more you define interesting things as far as uh, spatial relationships and the more you have interesting asymmetrical ways to move through that space, the tiers, you know, sliding downwards and the water wheel going upwards. You just have a lot more interesting ways to move around. And, and then I want to show you one last thing that happened in the film. All right, really cool. <laughs> so like yeah this tiger isn't real but typically in video games we know a lot about our own characters and other characters right we can see their levels um 
we can kind of get a sense of what moves they have. We can kind of, um, you know, see stats and gauge strength that way. Or, and, but a lot of times in these in these films, right, you're encountering so many unknown elements because so many things and scenarios are not repeated that just like what we saw in the other scene, you have to really do a good job of how you convey information, right? But, you know, there's a lot of information in video games that... Um, isn't conveyed very well uh, with stats or whatever. And even beyond that, if you don't want to just give raw data to to describe and effectively communicate what's happening in the gameplay, then consider something like this, right? So in, in essence, this, the basic idea is the projection of your strength, your animal projection would be representative of your strength as a character so maybe all your invisible stats all your your leveling all your technique or whatever is conveyed purely through the visual and maybe aural uh, elements of your animal projection and i think that's a really cool way to start thinking about feedback uh, especially when you can take some creative liberties like this but let me show you let me show you one idea that i wrote about a while ago i wrote this article series talking about the Pokemon RPG series and uh, this is part seven of that series so I wrote this in 2011 and this is a uh, hard printed version of my blog but you can see here do, 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 which I'll show you in color in a second the basic idea is that you animate Pokemon in different ways to show their their strengths even relatively to their their own stats so right here instead of looking at something like where is it? Instead of looking like something like this, where you're seeing numbers and you have to interpret hit points and attack points and defense and and um, to gauge the relative strength of a Pokemon, what if their relative strength were reflected in their physical appearance, right? So the bigger the bulb on Bulbasaur, huh, my favorite Pokemon, or this is Ivasaur. Ivasaur is my favorite. <laughs> the bigger the bulb, the more special defense it has, or the bigger the leaves, the more special attack it has. The bigger its its body, the more physical defense, right? And so on and so forth. The, the thinner its legs, the higher its speed. Um, you can do a lot of creative things like this to just have the visual language communicate important information about what's happening in the game. And that's essentially what uh, I'm getting at with this, this Journey to the West uh, animal projection idea. If you have a martial arts game where characters have different techniques and stats and levels and ability to make different builds or whatever, it would be pretty interesting to reflect those differences in some kind of um, visually interesting way and, and you would you could make it to where just like with the the Pokemon the size of the tiger the translucence of the tiger what the tiger does with this animation does it does it claw at you or does it roar or whatever that could all be di directly um, direct feedback about the underlying stats in the system so that was our episode of Design Over Time for Monday uh, today, and I wanted to give you a little bit of a taste on sort of the kinds of things I think about on a daily basis when I watch movies. So I'm always thinking like, well, how does this movie communicate what it's doing? Does it have internal consistency? What does that mean to have internal consistency in a fight? Does it help me relate to the characters and to the events better? It should. Um, and then I can take creative things like animal projections or the way they construct their scenes and go like, this is really interesting. The scenes in this movie are good for a reason and it's usually because of a lot of little steps that pay attention to to the core of what they're trying to do in the film, which is convey the, the actions and the, the characters, like convey their personalities, their strengths, their weaknesses, and, and what they do in the context of these elaborate uh, scenes and scenarios and plots. That is like the main purpose of why these scenes are here. So looking at all the various ways that they construct these unique scenes and the ones that do well, do well because they pay attention to those things throughout. And they want to give you an interesting landscape to show the characters being different, being bold, being daring, being strong. And this is why I just want to pluck a few ideas out of this film and share them with you guys. So if you want more of this content, you know, looking at different, looking at other mediums altogether and trying to figure out what it does well and how that can translate to video games, you know, I love doing this kind of stuff. Uh, until then, you know, that has been our episode of Design Over Time. You can follow us at Design Oriented on Twitter or subscribe to us down there on YouTube. We make one of these videos every day and you can follow me uh, at Kirby Kid on Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments or get to us on Twitter. That is the best way to reach us. We will be sure to get back to you by the end of the week. Yeah, so until next time, 
That has been Design Over Time. See you later.